So we can start now. Uh, first, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Mota. Uh, I work in Belgium uh, in the University of Liège. Actually, it's the uh, Jean Blue Agrobiotech, which is a, a campus united with the University of Liège. And I myself and Said Naderi, Edi Amami, and Nicola Gengler, uh, which is my boss, we are uh, the person in uh, people involved in the in the in this project. So here's my contact. If you need me after the presentation or anyhow to talk about modeling and to ask that be okay. By the way, uh, was I mean. Uh, I've been told that uh, I'll talk about modeling and draws here, so I try to, to put this, try really to tell a history about uh, how you can model and then apply for, for a GWAS. I, I believe uh, and I hope that uh, uh, something will be pretty basic for some of you guys, but then uh, by the end, uh, I hope then you can assimilate something that, that's quite new and then you expected from this, from this talk. So, uh, this is a, an overview of the talk. I, I, I divided it in, in three topics. The first one, an animal breed history, a summary in, the, in dairy cattle. So a brief introduction and uh, we'll talk about the traditional genetic evaluations and also statistical models that, that have been applied and the different models that you can apply in, uh, in dairy cattle genomic, uh, genetic evaluations. Then it comes the G plus E contribution to animal, be, uh, to animal breeding, how G plus E can uh, contribute uh, for more efficient uh, genetic and also genomic evaluations in, in dairy cattle. And by the end, the third topic, uh, we'll talk a little bit about genomic uh, association study, the GWAS. I'll talk about some examples, uh, some theoretical stuff, and then uh, we can go through a, a practical example how to perform uh, GWAS using uh, R which is the software that I normally use when I'm working in, in Belgium. All right then, so to start, so uh, a brief of uh, introduction of animal breeding in dairy cattle. Uh, we can see here that this is a picture that I take from a website called Eurostat that uh, tells us uh, why milk is important in the uh, European Union. So you can see that 30% of the milk production is used for cheese, 30% uh, for butter, 13% for cream, 11% for drinking milk, which, which I want to say that milk, it's important in so many ways. We can use milk for different uh, situations. And then we should uh, try to increase milk production for, uh, for, uh, in cows because it's an important uh, product in our diet. So, and... Uh, by the end, when you have the, the milk production, the milk by itself, there's a lot of factors that, that affect this, uh, uh, the milk that goes to your home. And one of them is genetics, not, but not only genetics. Genetics is part of them. It's a, one of the factors that we can, we can act and try to, in, by the end, increase get uh, uh, milk production by selecting, for example, more efficient dairy cows. But we have also other effects, like random effects, parity number, management. All of those are important facts that should be, if possible by us, control to get better uh, uh, or more efficient uh, cows in our, in our system. Because by the end of the day, our interest in it's always to select individuals with high genetic merit and then increase the average of the population. In case when increase is good, of course, uh, you have situations when decrease is good. For example, I'll give an example of uh, disease resistance. So less is better. But just uh, an example, we, have, we need to, by uh, generation to generation, increase the, the average of the population. And then, historically, you can see that when we new, new things uh, arise, uh, the accuracy of those evaluations increased. Everything started before Christ, when visual score was used to, to select animals. And then, uh, by the 700s, pedigree uh, started to be used to help uh, farmers to, to, to select cows 
uh, and, uh, and bulls to be the, the parents of the next generation. By the 1800s, the record starts to be used. 1900, index started to be applied, and so on and so on. And then when we, when we like 2000, uh, efficient uh, genetic evaluation systems uh, are used for different countries in dairy cattle, and by using the, the estimated breeding value as a way to, to select better animals and uh, better bulls, for example. And I would say recently, but uh, eight years, it's quite, oh, sorry, it's quite far. Uh, the genomic started to be uh, really used in, uh, in evaluations. And it's a tool that was uh, added to evaluations to help uh, to, to select better animals in the dairy system. And all of those, as I said, contributed somehow to increase the occurrence uh, of those predictions over time. If we look at a traditional genetic evaluation system, so we need to be aware that we need, we need phenotypic and pedigree information, so that need to be recorded. And then we apply uh, uh, a model, a statistical model that fits well in our, in our situation, for our population. To the end, get the prediction of environment effects that, that might be important in each situation, and uh, the predict of uh, estimated breeding values. And uh, to, to get this information, there's different source that you can, uh, you can get phenotypic and pedigree information. We can, for example, do it manually by, uh, by recording uh, ourselves or using systems that help us through, nowadays through robots to get those information that might be applied in, uh, in genetic evaluations in dairy cow systems. Or uh, uh, here, when veterinarians uh, take some records that also can be applied for some traits, uh, even uh, labs, that, uh, which is the case for the MIR traits that we, can, we, we, talk, we talk later. All of those are sources that are really useful and that uh, uh, might be recorded carefully to have a good quality of records to use in um, genetic evaluation systems. And also, the identification uh, of the animals, it's, it's quite important as well to be used and uh, the models they use nowadays to, to, to estimate uh, genetic merits. If you look in the model in a traditional way, so here we have Y, which is the observation, milk production, protein production, uh, fat, whatever, that will be in function of, of fixed effects and the genetic part plus a residual. And through time, uh, this was used through the mixed model equations methodology when you include the pedigree, environment effects, and you have the, the, the observations from, from animals. You use BLUP, the, uh, the, the methodology through mixed uh, model equations, to estimate genetic, ver uh, genetic merits or estimated breeding values uh, for animals. However, in this situation, we, what, what happens with the genes? We actually do not know. What we estimated here through uh, genetic merit is the cumulative effect of those genes. We take the average as a prediction, but we actually do not know how uh, specific genes act in this situation. And so far what has been done in, uh, in these situations that imagine here we have three animals and we can imagine those are, are three lactation curves for those animals. And you have here uh, test days in different points. And when you talk about modeling, we can uh, fit those models in different ways. The first one, we can use, for example, what you, we call unitrate models. For somehow, we are interested to know the, uh, to select animals based on this specifically test day model. So we have no, we have no information uh, regarding correlation between those points in that case. So we, we can apply uh, a selection, use this point as one trait, this point as another trait, but with no correlation between them. 
There's other possibilities. Another one, we can, we can use a repeatability model. Instead of using each, each of those test days as a different trait, we can use those as a different measures. And in a repeatability model, the in this case, we assume that the correlation between those points is equal to one. There's, because they are, not, they, are, they are not different traits, but they are different measures, uh, different measures of uh, the same cow over time. Third possibility, what you call multi-trait model. In that case, what happens that the correlation, we assume that each uh, of those, those test days are a different trait, but in that case, we, we are going to evaluate those jointly. And then we have a correlation between those points, and this correlation might be different from one. However, uh, which is actually commonly in, a, in a, when you talk about milk production in a dairy and dairy cattle systems, uh, this lactation curve can be described as a function instead of points. And then you can describe those, for example, in a nonlinear way. For example, if you're interested to, to estimate parameters at the, uh, the, in the initial of the lactation, of the peak of the lactation, even uh, the slope of the lactation curve, or you can do that through random regression models and uh, using linear or nonlinear. When in this case, the, the points, they are, they are assumed as different measures, but you can uh, calculate correlations between those points. So you don't have only the, the prediction for the points specifically, but from the entire interval, from the entire lactation curve. And uh, a good point by using those, for example, you can here estimate the, the, the point of higher heritability, which give, will give you higher uh, genetic gain. And uh, why I end with this one? It's because uh, the most commonly model used in genetic dairy systems, it is indeed the, the random regression model, which is commonly called uh, test day models. When you estimate, you, here again we have the three animals, and you estimate the predictions through the entire curve for, uh, for the, the animals. And then what happened in this model? I don't know if everyone saw that, but imagine if we lose this point, right? If you assume as, as different traits instead of uh, a function over the, the entire lactation, you can, by using BLUP, estimate that point with no problems. However, imagine a situation when we have, for all animals, we don't know information of those uh, test days. We have no, if you use those as different traits, we have no information about this period. But by using a model like a random regression model that describes the entire lactation, you can infer through all over the lactation. And then you can cover those points, those points, those points through uh, uh, estimation. So what would be the best model then? So it depends in each situation it depends on your population. It, there are lots of facts that we will account when you're looking for the best model to, uh, to fit in your evaluation. Uh, maybe a model, when you have a, a, a lactation curve like that, you say that, oh, maybe use something uh, quadratic, uh, exponential, or whatever. It would be better to fit the data. But this will cause a hyperparameterization of your model. So, and you can have problems of conversions of any types. And somehow, maybe by using a, a, a simple model that can as well describe the situation, we will avoid this kind of problem when you uh, actually doing the, the genetic evaluation uh, for dairy cows. We just have to be aware that uh, the quality of information, it's essential, it's really important. Because if you're not doing that and garbage is going to the computers, garbage is, is going out. There's no way, you know? And uh, so uh, we have really to be aware of the importance of the quality of the, 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 the recording systems. Phenot phenotypes, 
pedigree, and nowadays even the quality of the genotypes that we'll talk later. For example, uh, recording and genotype. Here I'll, I'll give you an example of recording. You can have something like this, for example. You, you expect it to give a good phenotype in, in for a cow, but then when the result comes out, then you realize something's wrong. So, and maybe it might be, might be because of the quality of the input you have in your system. Another situation, imagine for a quail that uh, weights like point uh, point 0.4 kilos, and then suddenly, by mistake, you put uh, 465 kilos. We actually have a quail bigger than a human, so this is something wrong. So those are the things that we have to control in our system that uh, we will allow us to get uh, a better prediction of our genetic merits or that uh, we are looking for. So again, we, we need to have in mind that the data consistent is essential. It's really important in uh, genetic evaluations. I normally say that uh, an animal breeding program, and dairy care is not different, works like an engine. So different parts that are connected and they need each other. Uh, they need to get along to, for us to get successful what we're doing. So we need by the end to select, to get genetic progress, select better animals, right? Uh, identification of bulls, for example, with high marriages. And for that, the common use situation is the progeny test. I won't be specifically on this topic because Dara will talk a little bit more about this, but just to give an idea, this is an example that I took uh, from a country that is not part of a GPLZ, but it's my native country, Brazil. In Brazil, we have lots of steps when you get the final result of a progeny test. I, I don't think it's going to be that different from the others, but there, uh, for example, a bull that is a, a candidate to be a, a, a breed stock goes to a, a center and a semen starts to be collected and it's distributed freely to farmers. And then the, 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 the daughters of this bull start to, to be born. Uh, they enter in reproductive, uh, reproduct reproductive, uh, reproductivity age. <laughs> They, they start the lactation and finish, and finish the lactation. It's by that time when you really have your phenotypes and you can evaluate this bull if it's a good bull or if it's not. And then it comes out, for example, the catalogs. And how long does it take? Well, if you go through all the parts, when the young bull, you have uh, the, sem the semen available uh, for this bull, it's up to 30 months. Then you inseminate the cows plus nine months to the daughters to start to be, uh, to be born. Plus 30 months for the daughters to be uh, in uh, reproduction age. Plus 90 months for these daughters to, uh, to start to, to bear, it, bear it. And then plus 10 months to the end of the lactation. If you look at that and do not consider the first 30 months that uh, to the bull to be available for uh, semen uh, availability, it's up to five years, so it's long. If you, if you take the whole process, it's something like seven years and four months for really evaluate a bull if it's uh, good or not. I'm talking about this because I'll show you later about genomics. How can we uh, re really reduce this time? Uh, I'm not saying that genomics will uh, replace progeny test, might be the case uh, in, in some countries, but I myself see genomics as an, as an additional tool and not something that uh, will uh, replace, for example, progeny test. So, and then just to give an example, if you have two bulls, then when we uh, calculated the, the PTA, the prediction transmittability uh, of those bulls, we have here 500 and 200. And uh, that's the information you normally have in, uh, in catalogs and so on. We, we see a 300 kilos difference between those, those bulls, which means that in average, the daughters of the bull way you produce, produce 30, uh, 300 kilos more of milk than the bulls, uh, than the daughters of bulls be. 
And uh, this is specifically one of my, my working in Belgium. Uh, what happened, uh, I don't know, two decades ago, uh, I, but Interbu uh, came up, which is an international evaluation in dairy systems because semen is, uh, is uh, sell all over the world, and for, in, especially in, uh, in hostings. And then uh, this was uh, this uh, organization, I can put like that, uh, was, cr uh, was created in, uh, in Sweden, Uppsala, Sweden, to help uh, uh, breeders and, uh, to see if, for example, a bull born in Belgium, it's a good, would be a good bull, for example, in France or the Netherlands, on the UK or whatever. So, sorry? Or Romania. Or Romania. Yeah, why not? So summarize this. This you can find in the, the, the website of Interbu. Uh, all countries that are partners, they do their local genetic evaluations. And then they uh, send to Interbu. For example, here, three, uh, three bulls goes from the, uh, go from the, the country A, and three bulls go from the country B. Both countries send three bulls. And this is the ranking. So sire A1, it's the better bull in country A, and uh, A3 is the worst. And here, B1 is the best, and B3 is the worst for country B. So Interbu uh, gets this data, put everything together, and apply uh, what they call uh, multiple across country evaluation, the MACE. And each country receives a ranking of all bulls, all six bulls, but in their scale. What I mean by that? For example, in country A, sire A1 continues to be the top one. But actually, the sire B2 is the third one for country A, and it's not even the best for country B. And then for country B, B1 continues to be the, the best one, which means that uh, if, if, you, if you're a farmer in country A and are interested in buy semen from sire B, you, B1, it does not look like you get your answer because it's, you have better options in, uh, in your country than a country for for uh, then a sire from country B. So this is a way to help you to, uh, when you're up to, to buy semen, for farmers, for example, to buy semen, to choose between the, the best sires, uh, consider different countries, available in different countries. So during all those years of evaluations and so on, what problem occur is that in average, uh, a natural life expectancy for a cow, it's, I don't know if, yeah, it's hard to see, but it's 20 years. But actually, cows have been slaughtered with 5.5 years. So uh, we are far away from the natural uh, life expectancy. And uh, the, the selection during several years was, was done take into account production traits, milk production, fat, uh, protein, and so on. And uh, traits like longevity, fertility, welfare traits, they, they're kind of forgotten for, uh, uh, for, for dairy systems. And uh, we saw that with the, over time, cows uh, were being slaughtered early and early and early. And, uh, uh, everyone start to to look more carefully let's put it like that with this the this situation and how be the the solution so how can we we keep the cow health then to give us more more milk so that question can be answered by G plus e that we will talk in the next section so questions so far Uh, what is the, the percentage of errors in pedigree in your analysis, for example? Like, yeah, this in is average. In average? Yeah. This is quite, because uh, in our situation now uh, we have a, a better control of the, the quality. So uh, 
uh, I can say for each evaluation, we apply three, uh, three evaluations per year. Mm -hmm. So each evaluation, I'll say I have, uh, I don't know, maybe four, especially if the help of genomics now we can detect easily, if you have a conflict of, uh, of pedigree. So I'd say four or five animals per evaluation. But the number of new animals that, uh, that arrive, it, it, it changes uh, between uh, evaluations. So it's quite hard to, to, to tell you a specific number. But in average, I get four or five problems of pedigree that has to be uh, correct for the next evaluation. For, Those animals- For animals, not for- For, for animals, yeah, for animals, yeah. So the, uh, because now we have a really uh, restricted uh, uh, way to, to get the pedigree. Uh, it's it's uh, most of the uh, most of the information is it's not collected by farmers but by technicians that uh, do that job. So it it's getting better and better and better. But still there are problems because uh, there are situ I can tell you situations that occurs in Belgium and uh, uh, for example farmers use two different semen in one cow. They use. Uh, two different bulls in one cow, and they actually do not know uh, the father. Yeah, so uh, sometimes it, it's possible uh, they agree to genotype, and then we can, uh, by parented te yeah, paternity test, we mm -hmm. can correct those things. But still, uh, we are not. Uh, how can I? We, we are not safe of those problems. Mm -hmm. and There's for example, if you are not sure about the the parents of of one animal. He's removed from the evaluation, yeah. The animal? He's removed from the evaluation, yeah. Okay, so yeah. you are not keeping... We cannot, ac no, we cannot account for such an, we cannot predict something that we are not uh, aware, you know. Uh, this is trick, this is cheating sh yeah. uh, the, the evaluation, so we, we remove yeah. those. Of course, it might have animals in the evaluation that the yeah, pedigree might, be, yeah, but uh, we could not detect. I don't know, somehow, mm -hmm. especially the, the older animals when the, the system maybe was not that accurate. Thank you. As you said before, uh, progeny testing is the uh, most precise method, but unfortunately, it's time consuming and very expensive. Uh, let's uh, consider we have uh, one, a team of 100 young bulls and test them genomic after 12 months and we get a ranking from 1 to 100 mm -hmm. and then go in progeny testing. After 7 years we have another ranking. Mm -hmm. Which is the correlation between the two rankings? Uh, did this uh, depends. For example, we have this, uh, we actually expect that correlation to be high higher at 0.9 with yeah higher than 0.9 but that's that's the thing that people may confuse i'll talk about it but uh when you when you genotype a young bull and then you have the gbv really fast the reliability associated to this value it's of course lower than the reliability you get after you have daughters of those bulls distributed in several herds right but and uh, the, the, the genomic is not a way to replace progeny tests. It's not, it's not because that bull uh, had, a, I'd say, quite good reliability at birth, for example, 0 0.55, I don't know, that this bull will be really good after having daughters distributed on the herds. We expect it to be a well, correlation higher than 0 0.9, but it, this has to be looked in an overall situation because what farmers do time to time, they look at a, a specific sit, uh, individual, individual bull. You look, at, you look at the GBV when the bull is young and after some years they said, oh, but the, the, the correlation of this specific bull is not good between the GBV and the EBV. We have to look in an overall situation. Looking each point by each point, it's not a, a correct way to, to look at it. paper regarding the comparison between progeny testing and genomics mm -hmm. and he wrote that uh, genomic testing uh, get two times genetic prog progress comparing with progeny testing 
and the trend should be to replace uh, yeah no yeah i and, uh, also i had a discussion with uh, also uh, ken weigel from uh, madison university and he told me that at hochstein in the united states 80 percent of salmon on market are from young bulls and the trend is just to replace uh, this method yeah uh but i don't know if it's gonna be uh that easy, I would say, because we need phenotypes. Re yeah. oh, because because you, you, cannot, you cannot use your prediction equation forever. You, you need phenotypes to re-estimate your, your SNP effects over time, to predict the, 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 the DGV or the GBV when you include the parent average. But, uh, so that's why I think, uh, for example, we use that now but we, we still continue to send to interbull polygenic ev genetic evaluations, bulls that have, uh, that have daughters uh, all over the world. Of course, some, for some situations, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think France tried to, to abolish the, the progen test, or they actually did, uh, and they, they rely on, really on, uh, on genomics. Yeah, but it's complicated because there are lots of, uh, uh, of facts that may act in with time, you can have problems. For example, uh, there are lots of, uh, some of studies saying that, for example, uh, uh, if you genotype an animal after four generations, you can forget this genotype, you know, when you, you're working with a reference population. So this is one of the, pro the, the things that may affect, for example, your equation through time. But uh, yes, I, I'm not saying that it's not possible to replace, but I, I, I prefer to, this is uh, my way to think. I prefer to believe that genomics is an additional tool to help us to get better predictions than something that, uh, I mean, you cause a revolution and then, you know, like, uh, now we do not need to spend any money on progeny tests and so on. It might happen in the future. I don't know. But for now, I think it's still, we're going for some years using progeny tests to really prove that that bull that was predicted when he was born it's indeed good when the daughters uh, produce, produce milk. Yeah, but actually, like I said, it's expected to have really high correlation between the GBV and, uh, and the EBV, but we have, we have cases that it's not, and uh, if you look at individually, it's not the, the right way to do. You have to look at an overall situation. No problem. I'll just get work. It's okay. I think it's like this. <laughs> ah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> More questions, or can we continue? So. Like I was saying, uh, over the years, uh, everyone uh, was focused on pr production traits, milk, fat, protein, and uh, traits like longevity, fertility traits, reproduction traits, they are all uh, uh, important as well to account for, the, for more longevity cows. Let's put it like that. And uh, how to do that is one of the the objects of, uh, of G plus Z. So if we uh, summarize G plus Z in few words, uh, Clement uh, showed that, but G plus Z cont uh, contributes the sustainable of dairy cow production systems uh, through the optimal integration of genomic selection that we talk later and novel managed protocols based on development and exploitation of genomic data and supporting novel phenotypes approach. Actually, it's uh, to put together uh, novel traits and genomics. Uh, in this case, I, I can consider novel traits, for example, even fertility and longevity, but also MIR traits and genomics uh, to help us to have more sustainable dairy cow systems. If you look at the, the, the goal of the project, it's to improve sustainability of dairy production systems through the integration of genomic selection and management strategies. So we are interested in the genomic part, but also in the environmental one. That's why G plus Z. 
Uh, this is just some information that it's funded by uh, uh, FP7, uh, European Union funded project, and consists in nine work packages. It's a five-year project that started in 2014 and 15 partners, six from uh, uh, Europe and uh, US and also China. If we summarize uh, G plus E in a realistic ap approach, I would say that we can account for in four situations, the phenotypes, how we get those novel traits, those novel phenotypes, the pedigree information that is clear, important, uh, the environment conditions, we, uh, we, we should also account in the situation, and genomics. Through a statistical model, we can have then more insights on the biological uh, background of, uh, of G plus E. The first one, like I said, we talk about, I won't spend time on this pedigree, so we need uh, better and better ways to, to, to collect pedigree in a more accurate uh, way to get better predictions over time. And then uh, what I call here phenomics, Th those are, are, for example, novel traits. In Belgium, we've been using uh, MIR traits uh, uh, as direct or indirect predictions, for example, for longevity, fertility, and so on. Uh, Clement talked uh, a lot about this, but just to summarize how we get these phenotypes, so those are the milk samples. Then uh, those milk samples go through a, a, a MIR analysis through an equipment, for example, FOS, it's one brand of those equipments, but you have uh, uh, other brands. And then this generates the spectra. Those spectra go through a ca uh, calibration equations, and then we have our phenotype that might be minor, uh, major, minor biomarker traits, for example, acetone, uh, BHB, uh, what else, uh, C18, Cis9, those are, are what we call biomarkers or MIR traits that we can use as direct or indirect predictions in, uh, in dairy cattle. This, uh, the third point is the environment conditions. If you look in a climate contest, so uh, losses have been measured through time into, for example, heat wave. If you guys have been here in Europe for maybe two or three weeks this, this year, we had a really, really uh, uh, hot, we had really hot days. So it was, at least in Belgium, those are not expected at all because Belgium is raining all the time, winding and so on. So, and during two, no, I'd say more, three weeks or maybe a month with no rain, really high temperatures and so on. So, and, and I'm saying that because those, really, the, 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 the heat, but also when it's, it's too cold, both of them cause stress in our cattle. And then, to put, to put them cool, you have to spend money on that. But you can act, act in other ways that will uh, help us uh, to get better animals. What I'm trying to say is that if we use genetics, if you use animal breeding, you can then predict it, for example, more robust cows. Cows that are less sensitive to heat or to cold. And that even though with high temperatures or, free, uh, coding, uh, or freezing temperatures, those cows will keep more or less constant in terms of production uh, all over the, his, uh, his life. And uh, the fact of uh, stress leads us to this question. How can we link uh, milk yield and composition sterile and internal stress factors? We can use, for example, one type of model called reaction, reaction or models that we can account uh, for the, the environment through the, through the lactation. Really common in, uh, in dairy cattle, if you're interested to see the heat stress over the lactation, one uh, index that we use as environment is the THI, which is the temperature humidity index. And then we can calculate the, the genetic merit of the, of the animal over time, the entire uh, in different uh, THI levels. So you have a range of THI, 
here, for example, from 62 to 78. And then you can uh, calculate the, the generic merit of those, animal, of those animals in different situations, in different environments. What happens here? Here we have two animals, and then we see that uh, this is the slope of, of the animal A and then the slope of the animal B. If you look at it in terms of prediction, so the, the, the breeding value of an animal will be equal to the intercept plus the slope times the THI, in this case, the environment. And then, which means that animals with higher slope, they are less resilient or they are more susceptible. And in this case, we are looking for animals that are less, uh, they are less uh, susceptible through uh, climate condition change. So in that case, uh, we'd, we'd be selecting uh, the animal B than the animal A because this cow, or if it's a bull, whatever, uh, the, you'd be more constant uh, over the, the different environments that we have. So if it's the, the, the THI is too high, uh, you do not expect it a really big difference when the THI is too low. And on the other hand, for animal A, you expected a uh, higher difference between uh, the extremes in the, of the THIs. In a practical situation, what we are looking for, it's like this. Imagine here it's the map of Belgium divided by Flanders and Wallonia. I know Belgium, it's, it's really small country, but even though we can have some environment uh, uh, problems acting in, in dairy cow systems. If you look in a big country as Brazil, for example, this is even worse. It's, it's complicated. But imagine here we have two bulls, and we see that the daughters of bull A in Flanders they are not stressed cows, but for bull B, those cows in Flanders are stressed. And it's just the opposite in, the, in, the, in Wallonia. We, can have, uh, we have uh, daughters of bulls A stressed and uh, daughters of bull B not stressed. And what we actually need, it's a bull that will produce daughters not stressed or less stressed all over the country. All, all over the, the, uh, the, I don't know, the continent, all over Europe. So, and by using reaction or models, we can, uh, we can select uh, animals that are less uh, susceptible to heat or to, to cold temperatures uh, based in different environments. In this case, for dairy care, we use commonly THI. And then it comes the the, the last part of the approach in G plus E, how G plus E can, can help us. So I'll go through some quick and uh, basic, uh, basic slides, and then we go directly uh, in, the, in the situation and, and with, uh, with GWAS. So if you summarize, we have in a genomic-wide selection, when we are trying to estimate uh, genomic breeding values of an animals, we have the pedigree information, we have phenotypes, here I put milk yield, but any trait of interesting, and we have genotypes. The DNA, uh, it's commonly used as NIP markers that we'll talk about, but you can have another uh, marker to estimate GBV and then select bulls uh, based on, not only bulls, but also cows, based on this genomic breeding value. Like I said, uh, the most common uh, uh, molecular marker used in uh, not only in dairy but beef and in animal production it's uh, those uh, the SNP markers that uh, they are defined as a marker that, that there is one one base difference uh, one polymorphism it, it's it's enough to define uh, an, uh, a mark. Uh, an allele as a base as a potential marker. What I'm saying, if you look at here, three individuals, we have no, no difference. So we have only the cytosine for all them here, here is only timine. There is no variability. But then when you look at here, for animal one, we have one timine and one cytosine, but for the second one, we have two timines. So here we have a difference. So this is a potential SNP marker. And how can we identify 
those from biological samples. So you can use different situations. You can use, for example, uh, hair, or in plants you can use leaves, uh, and you send those to a lab that use a kinds of DNA extraction. I'll not go on, on details. And then it comes what is important for us. So th th those SNPs, they are identified via wavelengths. And you can see here, yeah, it's quite complicated to see. But here, we have one potential, uh, SNP, potential uh, SNP marker. Here we have the second one, and here we have the third. Because it's only on those situations that you have variability. In all uh, others, you can see that all animals are the same for those three alleles. And a basic output that we receive from the, the lab, you receive something like this. You have the SNPs by animal. So we SNP 1, 2, and 3 for animal 1, 2, and 3. And then we receive this, which is called, commonly called a leu top. It comes on uh, base, cytosine, timine, adenine, and, and guanine. We receive this, the G-score, which is a, a value of quality of uh, genotyping. For example, Illumina use 0 0.15 uh, samples with values less than 0 0.15. They are, uh, they are removed from the, from the analysis. And we receive, which in my case, it's really the important thing which we're using for the, for the analysis. It's the uh, A, B, L, use. Of course, there are people that work with uh, top alleles, but uh, in my case, we, we, we work uh, with ABLUs. And then we can see that animal one, it's an uh, heterozygous for the, the first SNPs. It's AA for the second one and BB for the third. But if you look at for, for each SNP, you see that there is a variability. Animal one, it's AB. Animal two, it's BB. And animal three, it's AB. So there is a variability, which means that this is a potential uh, molecular marker, molecular SNP marker. And what is actually the importance of a SNP? So imagine we have here three genotypes in one, uh, in one locus, and then uh, we have for BU A, it's AA, BU B, AC, and the third one, it's CC. And then we see that the average protein yield for the first one is 20, the, the second is 15, and the third is 10. This means that uh, the, the, the addition of one, allele on, of one A allele implies in five units of more protein yield. So in this case, you'd be selecting animals with higher copies of A, A than C because uh, we are looking for animals with high uh, protein yield. In, if you summarize how the, 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 genetic, the genomic evaluation process uh, works, we can, do, we, we, we can summarize like this. We need a reference, what you call a reference population or a training population when we need non-phenotypes and genotypes. From that, we apply an evaluation, and you can come up with uh, what we call, we call a prediction equation. And uh, here we have the Ws, it might be the SNP effect. And the X would be the genotype ID, if the animal is A or if the animal is B. Or, in, in, of course, in that case, we, we, transform, we combine those. And transform, if it's AA, you, we can use, for example, uh, 1 if it's AB0 and if it's BB2. Or there is other parameterization like minus 1, 0, or 1. We'll talk about this. And then we got our prediction equation. So young candidates arrive. We actually do not need the phenotypes of those, those young candidates. And they actually do not have, because they are young, they do not have daughters uh, uh, producing milk uh, in herds. But we can genotype them and then use this in the prediction equation and easily come up with the DGV, which is the direct genomic value. And you can do selection on this. 
by by looking by ranking bulls based on DGVs, we can select the better bulls. This would be fantastic in a situation that the SNP effects did not change over time, but that's no longer true. So we still need phenotypes. Phenotypes continue to be the king. If you don't have phenotypes, it's, it's not going to work over time because you have to re-estimate this prediction equation uh, over time. When your reference populations change, you have to re-estimate your prediction equation. If you have enough animals coming to your, your evaluation, you need to re-estimate this prediction equation to, to easily calculate a DGV for, for a specific bull, for example. That's why I, I do not believe that we will completely replace progeny tests. Of it. it might happen, but uh, I still think that uh, phenotypes, it, it is still, like I said, the king, but it will continue to be, in my, uh, in my opinion. Well, if you look at, in terms of evaluation, what changed from the traditional one, uh, when we have here the relationship matrix based only on pedigree, now we can come up with a different matrix that do not account for pedigree, but the, the, the relationship between markers. How two animals are close uh, based on their, uh, their genotypes. And then uh, we can call this now the GBLUP instead of BLUP, which is the commonly uh, mixed model equation used uh, for polygenic evaluations. So if we try to exemplify this, how would it be? Uh, we have a bull. We, we, here we have a sire chromosome, so uh, red and uh, blue. In a case we do not know the genotypes, we consider this as average. We consider that those two offspring, one and two, they will carry half of the genes. We actually do not know, but in average, they will be 0.5. If the, they have the same uh, the same uh, dam, 0 0.5, or, or if they have the, only the same sire, 0 0.25. We work here with average. But when you genotype the animals, and for example here we have four offsprings, we can see that this value, it's not necessarily 0 0.25 or 0 0.5. It can be higher, it can be uh, lower. So here you see that, for example, animal 1 and animal 3 would be exactly... The same alleles were, were passed from the sire to, to animal one and three, but on the other hand, uh, they are completely different from animal two. And part of them, are, uh, and for animal four, they have part of the, the red and part of the blue. So it can happen um, through genetics. And actually, it's not, uh, we are now working with uh, the relationship based on markers and not the average based on, on pedigree. And what happens? This is a case when the, we have all animals genotyped. And then we can replace the matrix, the A matrix by the G matrix. What happens, and it's really, really common, if you don't have 100% of our population genotype, what happens with non partially genotype population? Like I said, if you have all, simple. You replace A by G, you get your evaluation. But if you do not have, how you construct G? You cannot. You don't have information for such animals. But we have now another methodology, just excuse me, all right, uh, called uh, call as single step blood that was developed by uh, Mistau and collaborators and Christensen Lund in Denmark that combines all together those information. So pedigree phenotypes and genotypes are combined and you can uh, estimate genomic uh, breeding values even if part of your population is not genotyped. How does that work? Uh, I won't go through details but you be like a third matrix. So you have now, instead of having one based only on pedigree or based only on markers, you have a third matrix here, I call H, that actually combine both information. It'd be like, if you have the genotypes, you account for the genotypes. 
but if you don't have, you can account for the pedigree information and come up with a combined matrix that will be used in your, uh, in your evaluation. And then if you go back through the, the slides, when I summarize the process of, uh, of the genetic, uh, genetic evaluation, when you have the reference population, then you estimate the prediction equation, you can then, if you have that situation, when all animals are genotyped, so it's easy. You have the number of mark, uh, you, have, you just have to apply uh, this formula to get the DGVs based on the number of markers and the genotype ID of the individual. You have your prediction equation and you have the ID of the individuals. So you calculated the DGV. But uh, when you look, when you're doing a, a single step genomic evaluation, you also account for pedigree. It's not only based on markers. And then that's something that has to be clear. In that case, we will come up with what I call here GBV, uh, which is a, a combination of DGV plus the parent average. So uh, we had, a, I'd say, a little bit of a problem in, uh, in our situation recently because people were comparing DGVs with, DG, with GBVs in calculated in different countries. So this is not, you're actually comparing apples with oranges because the G, DGV is just a part of the GBV. You have the whole parent average included on, on the value that might uh, 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 like plays with the, the correlation between those up or down. So then if you have, just to summarize, you have all animals genotypes, you come up with the DGV. You can also apart calculate the parent average and then sum up with the GBV and come up with the GBV. Uh, or if you use a single step evaluation when you account for everything altogether, uh, you can come up with the GBV that accounts for the PA, the parent average, and the DGV. And then, why all of this? It's, uh, this is a scenario when it would be really good if you could really replace progeny tests by genomics. If you calculate, for example, for a young sire at birth, the, the parent average, you, you calculate through Mendelian sample, and then you have an accuracy like, 0.2. But traditionally, this animal has to go through a progen test that takes five years at least and $5,000 uh, of cost, and you come up with, of course, a better accuracy. But what happens if you genotype this animal at birth, and then you're no longer spending this $5,000, and you select based only on this value? You get an accuracy of 0.5. So you'd be, uh, we were saving. Uh, time and also money. That'll be really good, but it does not mean exactly. This is already good reliability at birth, but it does not mean that these animals, when they have their daughters uh, spread all over uh, different herds, uh, that this animal will be, for example, an accuracy of 0 0.9, or it, you'll be actually really, really good. We expected that in average, we have a high correlation, like I said, between the, uh, those values. If you have the GBV at birth and then you have the EBV based on uh, the daughters, uh, we expect that in average those correlation be high. But we should not look at uh, individually. Maybe there be a bull that this is not the case. Questions? What would be <coughs> the minimum number of an, uh, of, a, of a breed to to have your pop population reference? Uh, this is also something that varies between different breeds. It, it, it's it's hard to come up with with numbers. I'd say more you have, better it is. Yeah, you know. I totally agree with you. Yeah, well, but give me, a, give me a number. For example, <laughs> for uh, in our case, for example, we have a reference population of uh, 1,000, uh, uh, 11,000 individuals. Uh, we can get good values with those, yes. But if, you, if we compare with the reference population of the United States, we got nothing, you know? So it, it, it depends because uh, uh, I think 
if you work in at when you start to have at least like I'd say 5,000, 6,000 animals genotyped, you start, you start, you know. But uh, less than that, uh, I don't know if it'd be. You can still use it, you know. It's better than nothing. But uh, but to to start to really to seek for better values for 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 more accurate uh, values, I'd say at least 5,000. But um, it's a random number that I, I'm giving you. Uh, we can, we, we are, f I'd say, we are maybe far to achieve the, what the United States is achieving uh, already. But now in Belgium, we, when you look at the values, so uh, in average, uh, we have a pretty good estimation when we have uh, 11,000 uh, animals genotyped. Well, but we need... Hostings, okay, yes. But there are some endangered or minority breeds? Yeah, so because that, that's the point. If you have really small population, yeah. uh, it, it's complicated. So maybe in this situation, less animals would be not enough, but uh, at least something to, to help you to, to, to predict better values. But uh, it's, quite, it, it's quite complicated to, to guess a real number, you know. Uh, I don't think even if I, of course, if I get a population, start to, to study and do lots of simulations and so on, we can come up with a, a better number. But this not only will depend on the different breeds, but actually uh, even the situation of your population, even, in, if it, even if it's the same breed, but in different situations, in different countries or whatever, might, might differ. Because I was asking a lot of persons, mm -hmm. which is the, the minimum number, and no one. Had no, it. yeah, <laughs> because uh, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. more you have, better it is, you yeah, know. Of course. <laughs> but I know it's it's complicated. It's getting better now. It's not that expensive to genotype uh, uh, an animal, but still, it's a lot of money to convince a special farmers to spend their their money on that. It, it's still uh, something quite hard, and uh, but better. Uh, more you have, better it is. So, and then uh, it's 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 quite hard to give you an exactly number, especially when it comes with different breeds. Okay, so in your mind, would five thousand would be the minimum? In hosting, yeah, I'd say so because uh, if uh, of course you can work. I'm not saying you cannot work with less. You can, but uh, we we started to see something with five thousand, but. We we really uh, we say we say to farmers all the time you need to, to, to genotype and we we get more and more animals so in two in two years we we got six thousand animals we had five thousand two years ago and now we have eleven thousand so it's it's something and I, more get better I, is I think you should look at your size of your population exactly. and also of variability yeah if, it, if you have like Individuals, if you have no variability, yeah, it's no, yeah, but uh, and then well, maybe, depends. yeah, if you have no variability, maybe there is no meaning to even genotype. <laughs> so that, that, that could be a uh, yes. Just genotyping for study or something like that. Yeah, it depends on uh, on different cases. You have to you have to do that and see uh, how SNPs are 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 contributing to explain the genetic variability of your situation. Because sometimes you have you don't have enough variability and then you won't achieve yeah. any kind of uh, uh, progress. If you don't have enough variability, you cannot calculate the impact. Of the exactly, that's the point. The that's true. Questions? Are we on time? What time is it? It's 12. 12. Okay. Yeah, you'll be okay. And then, so, uh, continuing, uh, we have here uh, the last part of the, the presentation today, which is the, the genome-wide association student. Stu studies. Well, uh, you have 
your genome, let's say your genomic evaluation, implemented and so on, but you are interested in, in see more through that. You have the SNP effects, and then you're, look, you're trying to see uh, if those effects are significant and uh, they are linked, for example, with KTLs of an important uh, trait, important economic trait. So a GWAS, in, for example, an, uh, can be applied in, different, in large populations in different range of environments. For that, we need phenotypes, and this can be direct phenotypes as milk production, fat, or uh, phenotypes based on MIR. Uh, the genotypes, of course, for example, uh, we can use HD SNPs, even uh, less density, or you can, for example, if you have different uh, versions, you have animals imputed for 10K, 50K, or, and 700K, you can impute them and use the imputation in, uh, in your analysis. It depends. In our case, for example, in Belgium, some cows are, are imputed with 10K, which, really which is really low, and then we normally impute those cows for 50K and use for, for our genomic evaluation. And, of course, uh, the pedigree information. Looking for major genes that, that might be uh, in liquid uh, disequilibrium with uh, large KTLs and, and may be important for some trait uh, of uh, economic interest. If you look at that, come back to the, the heat stress inside G plus E. Uh, the issue is that is there some specific genes responsible, for example, for heat stress in any milk trait of economic importance? in milk yield or even MIR traits as in, uh, indirect predictions. So to apply a GWAS, this is just a scheme, a uh, simple scheme that you can use. When you have your, your solutions, you have the GEBV for the intercept and slope. Remember that you use a reaction norm model, so we have an intercept and slope for, for each animal that were calculated based on phenotypes, genotypes, and also pedigree. In a situation that we do not have 100% the animal's genotypes, you use a single step GBLAB, and from that we could calculate the SNP effects. Now we have the SNP effects, and we can really uh, do a geno uh, genome wide association study and further look for genes that might be related with the, the specific trait we choose. Then I'll give you some examples uh, of uh, GWAS study that uh, were previously done. And uh, after that, we go through an example. How can we actually uh, do a GWAS study, for example, using R? So this is a work presented on uh, Croatia last August by Edi Amami. That it's a, a, he called multi-omics data integration approach for resilience of dairy cattle to heat stress. What we see here is that what he tried to, he was trying to say that he, he, he divided the, the, the lactation in three parts, what he called early lactation, middle lactation, and late lactation. And then he used reaction norm models and calculated the SNP effects for slope and for the, the SNP effects for the slope and for the intercept in these three parts of lactation. Here we see, Mar uh, here we see uh, Mahatan plots when each, each point is a SNP effect so here he had, I think, a 50K SNP. And we can see that for intercept, it's quite the same thing between the, between the uh, parts of the lactation. Even early, middle, or late, we can see that we have a peak in chromosome, not even my cell, 14, uh, when the one major gene re well known in, in dairy cattle, DG81, was... Uh, uh, was found, but when we look at the, the slope, which is the, the sensitivity of animals to heat stress, we can see that in early, lact early lactation and late lactation seems to be quite the same, but something happens in the middle of the lactation that this peak does not appear anymore. So even, I'm not talking about different lactations, I'm talking about inside the same lactation, you can have parts of them that different genes may be acting for some reason. 
If you look at this heat map, we see uh, those are SNPs, okay? Here we have SNPs, and here we have the THI. So we can see that the SNP effect varies according to the temperature humidity index, which, which means that we can f find different genes all over the, the, the different environments. So uh, here we have SNPs with uh, dark with uh, negative effects and here positive effects. And you can see for some, of course, for some SNPs, they're quite constant over time, but for some SNPs, for example, it's clear that the, the effect starts to increase when the THI increase. So we, no, we do not only have a genotype by environmental interaction based on breeding value, but also in the SNP effect. A SNP, the effect of the SNP vary according to the environment. In this case, vary according to the THI. This is, was another presentation that uh, he did in, uh, in Croatia when he was interested to see about uh, early, prog sorry, early programming of dairy cattle, a uh, potential explanation to the adaptation to climate change. In that case, what he was specifically looking for, three different lactations, but cows that uh, cough in, uh, coughed in, uh, in winter and in summer. And he looked if there are different genes acting on, uh, on those situations, or it, it does not matter. If a, ca a cow calf in winter or in, uh, in summer, it'd be the same. And then we can see here that in, in general, it looks quite the same because it's quite hard to see from Maharam plots, again, when we have points of uh, which point it's a SNP effect. But if you summarize this in a simple graph like this, you can see that 73 genes uh, that he calls significant, ge significant genes were shared between the environments. So they are, they are acting no matter winter or summer. But there were 16 genes specific to winter. So he could trace back 16 genes in winter but not in summer. And on the other hand, 11, 11 genes were specific on cows that conceived in, in summer. And uh, with this kind of information, you can go through gene networks, gene pathways that Claire talked yesterday, and uh, I don't know, you can really go further and further and further, but this is really not my, my topic. Uh, this is a third example that I, is one of my, my work during my PhD in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. We are, we are here, used uh, reaction norm models, but we were interested to see if the different uh, infestation level of ticks affected animals. So, and then we look if the genes, they were the same between three different levels of thick infestation, which is a major problem in, uh, in Brazil. And then we can see here that when you consider all kinds of, of tick, uh, tick burden, uh, we see some genes in common. But then uh, when we check for SNPs that were considered significant in a low uh, tick infestation level, we found those three genes. Then you can see here, for example, this gene, it's in a low tick burden. Uh, this is a really uh, well-known gene for, for milk production. It, it was not the case for, for tick burden. But just to exemplify that there are genes that were found here in a low tick uh, burden, but were not found in, in medium and high. In, in summary, in general, uh, the same genes were found in, in medium and high uh, tick burden, but in low tick burden uh, was completely different. And this can help uh, uh, not only in terms of selection, but understanding the, 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 bi the biology behind the tick, the, the tick resistance. The, another one, uh, this uh, was done during a postdoc that I did in, in Brazil. In this case, we were uh, 
interesting in C, uh, what are the genes affecting uh, H at first Calvin in, uh, in, in Miller cattle? What do we did here? Normally, in, uh, in, uh, in genomics, you have lots of SNPs with really, really small effect. And maybe this SNP does not say something to us. But what happens if instead of using one single SNP, you use a Windows of SNP? You attribute, I don't know, like you wish, a, a, a window that contains several SNPs, and then you look that if there are, for example, genes close to that SNP or inside, close to that window or inside that window that might affect, indeed, for, in this case, H at first column. So here, instead of having each point as each SNP, we have each point as windows. And then we overlap this through the entire SNPs. We create windows, and then we, we overlap those windows. You know, through, uh, through the, the entire uh, uh, density. And then we see here, for example, in here we have the significant uh, line, and you see that in, in some chromosomes, especially in 14, that we have a huge peak, so that might have genes related to H at first Calvin that may be uh, interest. Oops, sorry. So here we have uh, SNP windows. So this is the SNP when the windows start, and this is the SNP when the, 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 the window ended. We have the chromosome, the position of the, the first SNP, the start SNP, and the, the ended SNP, and the number of SNPs that we have in each window. Like I said, we were uh, moving the windows over the, the entire uh, panel of SNP. And I think one, uh, one really good thing that you can take from this table is that we have here the genetic variance explained by this window of SNPs. Maybe if you look at one SNP, you'd be really, really small. But then when you look in, in a window, you can, for example, here have 3% of the genetic variance is explained by that window, which means 2.5 days. So you can have cows uh, selected based on the, the SNPs on this window, Calvin two point days before in average than uh, uh, in average compared to the population. For example, the second one, 1 1.6. And then inside uh, that, that uh, window and also close to that window, we search for genes to see what are the genes that might be there and there's some pathway related to age at first Calvin. And for example, we, we figured out this one which is, uh, if I, no, I think I did not put here, but it's uh, a gene that is related in the, in the reproductive uh, mechanism. I think it's corpus luteum. I don't know if it's, the, it's correct in, in the term in, in English. So it is a gene that somehow affect the age that the, the calf, uh, that the cow calf. And we figured out other genes here, for example, those ones that may somehow uh, be related. Of course, the, we need to go further through uh, uh, studies, for example, gene networks and uh, pathways to figure out what's going on behind those genes that were detected in those uh, SNP windows. So, and then uh, basically, for a GWAS, we have some steps we have to follow to, to come up with uh, uh, our, our SNP effects or windows we, uh, of SNPs. And uh, I would say the first one, it's the data preparation. You need to prepare your data to apply a GWAS. The second one is SNP quality control. You need to, you get the, the SNPs. We are going through each term uh, specifically. But just to summarize, you get the, sni the, the SNPs from lab, and then you, you, not all of those SNPs are going to, <coughs> to be used. Some of them uh, have a, a poor quality and have to be removed based on some factors that we go, uh, we talk about it uh, in a minute. 
uh, the SNP effect estimation and significance that we use to see if a SNP or a window of SNPs are significant and you should use uh, them as, uh, as, uh, as a SNPs or windows uh, for to search for genes. And finally, the gene mapping. You search uh, for genes. There are different ways to search for genes. You can, uh, for example, by using R, you can, you can do everything, even uh, look for, for genes that might be related uh, with some uh, terms uh, that is, is specifically, those are, are specifically terms to the, the trait you're investigating. For example, age at first count. All right. So data preparation. What I did, what I did now, so uh, I hope you guys can, can follow. I just get a, a small data set. And I prepared this in R. I don't know if everyone here is familiar with R. Maybe not. Maybe use SAS or, or Python or whatever. But I try to do step by step. And uh, if you guys are not following, you can. I know it, the question is after. But maybe in this case, if you're not following, you can stop me and, uh, and ask. But just to give you an idea how you perform in uh, GWAS. And then if you need help later, uh, I can help you. Uh, I normally use R and uh, Blup F9 programs to, to perform a GWAS, but uh, uh, there is a way, for example, by using only, only R, and that's the way I'll, I'll show here because it was a, a simple way for guys to, to follow because I think we, we won't have time to, to use Blup F9 programs here. So I got here uh, one example. So here I'm just reading the, the file, and then we see like the table I showed in the beginning of the presentation, we have the SNPs and then we have the animal. So here is the same animal and different SNPs. And you have the allele top, allele 1 top, allele 2 top, allele 1 AB, allele 2 AB, and then the, the G score. The first thing you have to do is to transform our data in a way the, uh, for example, here and the package that I'll use in R uh, can read it, can use it. So first thing I have to do is combine those two columns. And then this is uh, just a common to paste, the first allele and the second allele. And then we come up with point point, which is missing. For the, so for the, the, this animal, the first SNP, we do not have information for, for this animal. The still for this animal, the, he, he's heterozygous for the second, for the third uh, SNP, but it's BB for the fourth. AA for the, the fifth, and so on and so on. So we combine those, uh, those columns, concatenate them, uh, and then uh, we are interested to see how many, how many uh, animals and SNPs we have. So here you have the, I just selected the, the, the columns I was interested in, so the SNPs, the ID, and then the combined uh, a, allele 1 AB and allele 2 AB. And this is a common just to see that we have here 230 SNPs and 200 animals in our data set. And uh, specifically for this package in R, we need to uh, transpose the data because we have SNPs and animals, but actually we need to have animals and by SNP. And then here it's just a, a common to, to transpose those. And you can see now that we have animal 1, 2, 3, and 2, 10. And then we have here each column for each SNP being missing heterozygous or homozygous. I have a question here. If we have like 10 million animals with whole genome, can we do that with our, like these steps? Uh, it'll be hard, but you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for example, if I have a medium laptop, I can do that, or I need mm, a server. I don't know, server. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And I, so. I, want, I want to be sure about no. that. Yeah. Even a million on your laptop, I'll doubt it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> OK? Yeah. So uh, then what I did here, if you remember, you come back here, that we have a column of uh, the SNP name. And I just put the, the, the name of the SNP here just to be easier to, to identify. So I'd say that <coughs> that would be the 
best format, uh, at least for R, to, to, to use your data. You have here the IDs, the SNPs, and then you put the name of ID to not be lost later in, uh, in your computation. So I use a specific package in R. It's called HEP, HEPEST XXR that you can uh, do uh, quality control and so on for, uh, for GWAS. And one of the things that we have to do, we have to transform those A, B in 0, 1s, and 2, and 3. Uh, normally, 3 would be the missing value, the two points. But here in, uh, in this specific package, missing has to be 0. And then A, A has to be 1, B, B has to be 2, and A, B has to be 3. And then when you look at the data transform, you see that now all of those SNPs, they are 0, 1, 2, or 3. OK. Then it comes the second part. With the, go ahead. If I have a missing genotype? Sorry? Yeah. Zero. Oh. Zero. Sorry. Yeah. Because normally, for example, if you go for blob F9 programs, missing is five. Yeah. There are there are uh, programs that it's it's different. But in this case, missing is zero, and then uh, yeah, yeah. You can also uh, work with zero, one, and minus one. As yes, for the the other package we're using really to do the GWAS, which is RR blob. Yeah. It's not even those those parameterization. It's minus one, zero, and one. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit about SNP quality control and how to do that. But if you're really interested to, to go a little bit further, so I advise this paper here. It, was, uh, it came out 2010 uh, from Kathy, Laurie, and, uh, and collaborators. So you guys can, can look at it. I, can <clears throat> I don't know if you, you guys will have the, the presentation later or no, but I can. Uh, 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 forward them to, to you as well. So I just summarized here. I'll go, uh, I'll talk each of, each, each of those factors. And if you guys don't understand, you can also uh, stop me. When we are, we are applying a quality control, there are three, uh, I would say, three parameters that we have to look for to exclude, uh, I would say, bad SNPs. Let's put it like that. And the first one is the call, the call rate. So the call rate, it's a ratio of uh, non-missing genotypes over the total. We are interested to see what is the percentage of missing genotypes in each SNP. In, I mean, in commonly, uh, people use 0 0.95 as a value. But uh, I've seen other studies, 0.9 or if you want to be more restricted, 0 0.98, which means this 0 0.9 means that 95% of the values of that SNP is non-missing. If it, the, the SNP has, for example, 94%, he's removed from, uh, from the evaluation from your study. You guys got it? It's OK. Second one, the minor allele frequency, like the I think it's self-explanatory. It's the frequency of the, the allele that ha, uh, has uh, a minor frequency in your population. You have two alleles. One you have higher frequency, and the other one you have uh, a minor frequency. And normally it's 0 0.05, which means that the minor allele frequency has to be at least 5%. Uh, otherwise, you will exclude this SNP. And the third one. It's the Hardwenberg equilibrium, uh, which measures the if a SNP it is in equilibrium. So you can do that through the you have the observed frequency and you have the expected frequency. And when you're working with too too many SNPs, you might have SNPs that are uh, that are not in a, in equilibrium. And normally you you can calculate a, a Q square. Uh, and uh, based on that, you see if those SNPs are in equilibrium or not. But in our case, uh, 
just because you, not just because, but because you have lots of SNPs and uh, those SNPs might not follow this uh, in a well term, uh, we use a, a correction, the Bonf Bonf Bonferroni correction, to eliminate SNPs that are significant uh, over this, uh, this calculated. So what do we use? We use the significance level, for example, 95% and then 0 0.5 divided by the number of SNPs. This is, but I've seen people use, for example, 10, 10 uh, minus seven, it depends. But this is one of the things that you can use. You use the significance divided by the, the number of SNPs. And SNPs that are significative to that, they are removed from, uh, from the analysis. Like I said, this is the package that I use to apply a quality control. And then if you go search for this, you can see uh, lots of, it's not only that, but uh, lots of explanation. Then for example, here explain how you can calculate the math through this package. And then I got here another example. So the first thing we need to install the package, call happy stxxr. Then we call the library, and then we can now work with this package. I, I hear, I read uh, another data, so that it's a red prepare. And you can see that we have the first column, IDs, 1, 2, 10, and then it's a red prepare for this package, 0, 1, 2, or 3. The ID? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We are actually not using it, so it doesn't matter. No, yeah, I mean, uh, w when I said I put the, the, the SNPs name, it's just for you to not confound. But in this case, for example, it's another data set. I just put SNP 1 to 9. It, it, yeah, it's just for you to uh, be able to identify the column you were, you're looking for. And, uh, but here, for example, for the ID as well, it can be uh, uh, letters or numbers. It doesn't matter. We are not using the ID. And here, the name of the SNP does not matter. Even it, For me, I, I, if you have, of course, you, for me, it's better to use the, the real name because it'd be, if you need to do some, some uh, I don't know, some commands in, in R, after you can, you can use. But here, it's just an, an example. All right, so first thing we do, we delete the ID column. That's why it's not important. You're not using the ID column to the quality control. And now uh, we create a column with the SNP name. So that's why I said it's better to use the real name of the SNP, but in this case, we use SNP1 to whatever. So we have here uh, uh, a vector of SNP, name, SNP names, one, two, three, four, that will be useful later for us. Now we can actually apply the quality control. There is a command in, uh, in the package, uh, which is math. Then you can apply. It would be A, I call A, but it doesn't matter. Uh, data frame, which is just an object in R. It's math of a SNP, which is the name of our data. And this is the command mark label for the names of the SNP for you not to be, to be lost. So you have then, again, the SNP, which is the data, and mark label is the, the names of the, the vector of names of the SNP. Uh, you are using the core rate only for the SNPs and for the animals, no? Yeah, that's, uh, I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, then here we have the result. We have here the core rate, for the SNPs, okay. uh, the minor allele frequency here, and the, uh, the chi-square value for the Hardwenberg equilibrium. In this case here, the car rate was applied for the SNPs, not for the animal. But it's, I mean, I would advise you to do the same. If you use Blup F9 programs, the program will do for you. But you can, but it's good not only to keep SNPs that have 95% uh, none, none missing uh, SNPs, but also animals that has more than 95% of their IDs of genotypes, none. 
Did you get it? Really? One thing it's the SNP, another thing it's the animal. And both has to be at least 95 or 90 percent uh, non missing values. So, and it's here when I, I indeed apply the quality control. So, I will keep only SNPs with 0 0.95 or higher for call rate, 0 0.05 for math, and 0 0.05 divided by the number of SNPs to the hardware bearing. Uh, then we can see here that the dimension is 500 animals by six, 699 SNPs. And before was 500 and 1,000 SNPs. So uh, uh, 301 SNPs were uh, deleted from the, the analysis because they do not follow those. Uh, 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 they do not follow the quality control. And then if you're interested to see uh, uh, exactly how many they are, we can, for example, do a table in R. So we, we see have, we have uh, here the zero, which is the missing in this case, uh, one and two, which are AA or AB, I don't remember, a, AA or B, e, BB or BB and AA, and three, which is the, the AB. Uh, then, because I, I'm going to use another package, I have to retransform, reparameterize the 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 SNPs. So actually, the zero now will become the miss uh, z zero, uh, which is the missing. You become three, one. You become zero, three. You become one, and two. It's it's already uh, done, and then we have now a good format. It's, uh, it's by coincidence, I, put the, I combine the ID again with the SNP1, which is my data. And uh, it's just a coincidence that we do not have three here, but uh, because I just uh, got the first 10 values. But uh, we have values of 0, 1, 2, and uh, 3 on this data. So we have now our quality control. It's, uh, it's time to do. Uh, to calculate the SNP effect and see how, how many of those SNPs are significant and we may look for, for genes afterwards. Okay, uh, like I said, I, uh, I'm going to use a package called uh, rrblup. So we install the package, call the library again, and uh, I'll, I'll read here uh, small uh, real data. I think it's in, in pigs, but it, it, it's not important. It's just to see that then we have 635 uh, animals and 2,500 uh, 2, SNPs. And uh, we need to, to create uh, a specific matrix with the good parameterization. And I did that. You can do the way you prefer, but I did that just to, to show that there is another possibility. For example, here we have 0, 1s, and 2s. This is the, uh, the parameterization. But this package use minus one, zero, and one. One way you can just replace like we did, but another way if you want to keep the, the original one and create another one, you can create, for example, a matrix of zero. So here you have only zero values. And then you replace. You replace zero by minus one, one by zero, and two by one. So we have here. Uh, the, the matrix in a good parameterization to be used in this specific package. Now you read the phenotypes. I read the phenotypes and then here we have the ID, we have a farm effect, I think this is year and month is slaughter, I, and here is the herd, and here actually the phenotype. I don't remember well exactly, but it's not important. Uh, we also need the map when it contains the SNP, the chromosome and the position. This would be useful to, to do the Manhattan plots and also for, to look for genes later. So one thing that we can do here, I did that for this specific case, but this will depend on your model. The, the map file should be uh, organized by chromosome? Yeah, by chromosome, yeah. Uh, I think I did that in uh, later, then ah. now it's not, yeah. So uh, it depends on your model, but 
in this case here, I corrected for the fixed effects to have only the genetic part of the observation and then apply the, the GWAS. So uh, Y1 would be my corrected phenotypes. If we come back here, here we have the original phenotypes. And here we have now, oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. The corrected phenotypes, corrected for the, the mean of the population the, the, and the, the effect, the year, month, slaughter, the farm, and the, the herd. And then we got our residuals, which is actually the genetic part of the observation. Just ahead to see uh, how was our, our, our data before. And now we need to prepare the file for the GWAS. Um, first thing you need to do, we need to put a SNP, and then all of those SNPs, we combine this, uh, and then we have a, a data like this with all of those SNPs, and SNP 1, 2, 3, and 4. We then merge the, the map with this data to have SNP, chromosome, position, and then all of those SNPs. And now we order by chromosome uh, and, uh, and position. And so we have the SNPs, the chromosome, ordered by chromosome and position, and all the, the values we need. Uh, here, uh, it's just, I just deleted uh, some not useful columns. We have the IDs and the corrected phenotype. And this is the function in the RR blob that you can apply the GWAS. You have the data file, you have the genotype file, and then those are functions, uh, uh, options that can be uh, uh, changed. It's, in this case, I advise to read the, the, the package. And then we have the, the GWAS. We have here now the SNP effects. And if we order them by higher to lower, now we have that the SNP thousand, for example, has the high effect in this situation. Uh, and this, in this case, uh, the Maharan plot will be, uh, will be done automatically, but you can use other functions in R or in other to, to, uh, to really do this, this kind of graph. But what is important here that we say that in this case, we trace the, the uh, here's the, the threshold, the, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, only seven SNPs on chromosome 12 are really significant and might say something to us regarding this situation. And if you look at back the, to, the, to the table, those are SNPs 1000, 1010, 1006, and, and so on. Those are the, the SNPs that we may be interested to, to look for genes that might be closer to, to, to these SNPs and uh, explain part of, of the genetic variance, for example, for, for this trait. And uh, how you do that? So I, I just put one example, but you can use R directly with some packets, for example, MESH, uh, that you can search for genes inside R. So he reads the, the website directly and you can do that. But if you're doing, imagine if you're doing for the first time and doing manually. For example, you can use a symbol. You go through the website, you select it here. For example, in our cow, whatever, but it's pig, pigs. And then you put, I put here cow, but uh, actually it's not cow. But if you come back here, we see that this SNP, chromosome 12, and this is the, the position of the SNP. And if I go, I put the, 12, two dots, and then normally we search in, uh, in a distance. You have the, SNP, the exactly SNP position, and then, for example, two, uh, 200 uh, before and two, uh, 2,000 uh, uh, pairs of base before and uh, after. So that's, I think that's what I did. If you look at here, it's 2,000 two less and 2,000 plus. And then you, you go, you just click go, and then you have here uh, this is exactly uh, this, what are you looking for. So in this case, it was too small, but you can see that if, if you, for example, use instead of one single SNP, but a window of SNPs that might be from here to here, for example, you can see that genes would be inside of this window or genes that might be close to this window that somehow explain part of genetic variance or something. 
Well, finally, uh, just to summarize some take-home message that uh, data consistency is really important no matter how for genotypes, phenotypes, pedigree. Otherwise, your, your input is, is trash and uh, your output certainly will be trash as well. Uh, the, model, the, the, the model choice depends on your situation uh, to describe your data. So I'm not talking about only genetic evaluations, but when you're applying the GWAS, uh, you should be aware that uh, some kind of models will, will be better to describe uh, your data. Uh, the way to, to calculate DGV is that it's only a part of the GBV that ac can account for the parent average. Uh, the SNP effect estimation that can be done f using different softwares and so on, and uh, the gene mapping. So that's what I, I was here to, to say. I hope uh, it was okay. I, with that, I would like to to acknowledge all the project and uh, all of those partners that help for so many uh, studies that we have been doing so far in the, inside G plus E. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Go ahead. Uh, if you can go backwards a little bit. Let's go. Because I was lost a little bit when you, you backwards at the, um, I think here. So we have the, the SNP now, the SNP file with the SNP chromosome position, SNP effect, no, backwards. Here, so okay. these files, how, how do you connect with the, the animal ID? So the first one, you have the SNP, the chromosome, the position, and all the SNPs. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Actually, here I just kept it order, so oh. I just needed to combine. But you have to be aware of that because if you, if for example, use some functions like merge, mm -hmm. you can you can lose this order, and you have to be sure that the order of your SNPs it's exactly. That's why, for example, if you have the SNP name, mm -hmm. and you have a column of uh, a SNP, okay. you can be sure that the first one is the first one, and so on. That's one of the reasons that it's good to, to have the, the real SNP name on the... Yeah, it's a, yeah. You can, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not such an expert in R, so for me it will be a problem. Because you sort it by chromosome and by length, and mm -hmm. at that point you can... Yeah, but I sort it after I combine it. Okay. So I kept the... the because when I received this, when I have the SNP map in this situation, it was exactly the same order as the data. Mm -hmm. So, and I did not mix with that before I concatenate in that case. But sometimes you have to do that. And then you can use, like he said, functions that, or you can, uh, and then you can check by the, the column and the, the column names if it's okay or not. Mm -hmm. But yes, you have to be aware of that to not uh, mix up things. How, how did you set the threshold yes, for the Manhattan plot? So how did you set the threshold uh, for the Manhattan plot? Yeah. Okay. This threshold yeah. right here. Yeah. For example, you can, uh, you can use different ways to, to, to set up a threshold for, for Manhattan. I think because this one, it's inside of the package. Uh, and then I'm trying to, to figure it out. But when I'm thinking, I can give you another example. Uh, one of the, the studies we, we did that we use win, uh, windows of SNPs, for example, we set up uh, based on the quantiles. We set up a measure by, uh, based on literature that will uh, show us if a, a window will be uh, significant or not. But there are different uh, ways to... Uh, to set up the, the significance because uh, you have so many, for example, uh, uh, false rates. And then you, I'm trying to remember how exactly the, the, the package does, but, uh, and then there is a correction, a buffer on correction, I think as well. Uh, I can check there and, and, uh, and tell you quickly, but I don't remember exactly, but it depends. You can. If you're looking for SNP effects, this one is the, one of the best ways to set up the threshold. Uh, but 
if you're looking, uh, if you're working with, for example, uh, Windows, you can set up in a different way to, so we, I'd say it, it depends on uh, what you work in. But I, I can check there in my laptop and just, I know it's a, it's a formula that, a formula that you use to, to set up the, the threshold. And another one, how, how do you set the length of the window? Because I saw you have 200, 290 and so on. Yeah, you can, you can by distance, by, in that case, we use the literature and uh, use the same distance, but uh, yeah, in that case was that. You use a distance of, for example, 1 KB, and then you just go, just guessing, you know, and you set up the first. You're not going to set, for example, if it's uh, a distance, X, then you're not going, in, in our case, we did not X, the second one, X, X, X. We did X, and then we X, we overlap. So windows were more, uh, the same windows were uh, more than once together. I don't know if I explained well. Yeah, we not divided in uh, equal parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We overlap those windows to be able to capture as much as we possible of, uh, of effect explaining the genetic variance of the trait. Because, for example, you have here the first window and here have the second. Maybe themselves they do not explain, but when you get half here, half here, it's, it's a window that explains more mm -hmm. than... The, yeah. So you have to try more and... Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not an easy situation, but it was that that we did in the, in the paper. Questions? More? <laughs> You said you also use Blob F90. If you have all of these scripts, why why did you use Blob F90 anymore? Because we do the evaluation using Blob F, uh, Blob F9 programs, and Blob F9 programs give us the SNP effect directly. So I just use R. I do the uh, I can I can do the quality control in uh, directly in Blob F90 yeah. everything, and then I have the SNP effect. But then uh, and Blob F9 gives me already a code yeah, in R, that, yeah. and then so you plot. The yeah. 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 So you said that it's easy in Blob F9 to obtain the SNP effects. Yeah, it's a, there is an option that you can ask and you and get. You can use, uh, but uh, I normally, because with data preparation, I use R. Before going to the Blob F90, yeah. mm -hmm. I need to prepare the data. I normally I use R. Sometimes I use SAS for specific things, but normally it's R. And then I, I go through the Blob F90 and, uh, and it can give me everything. But for example, I, I myself personally do not like the code that Blob F9 provides me and creates them ahead and plot. I don't like it. I prefer to use another package to, to do a better graph and so yeah, on. You yeah, just it's the just, effects and you yeah, it's just, it's not important, but uh, I myself, I prefer to use another. Uh, and other uh, functions to, to for Manhattan plots and, and so on. If, I w if I'm working with uh, uh, a linkage disequilibrium to, to do pairwise graphs and uh, things like that, I prefer to use R. No more questions? <laughs> so thank you again. <laughs>